hovering around 33 to 33 to 34%, which is down significantly. We are equally excited to be working in partnership with the Maryland Department of Service and Civic Innovation and looking forward to hearing more about the service year and their special presentation later on during this session. We are mission driven and singly focused on meeting the needs of students across the state of Maryland. And today's virtual town hall is the focus. We are equally delighted to be working in partnership with College Bound in the city of Baltimore. We have with us today, Ms. Ayana Jones, Director of Training and Early College Access from College Bound, who will be moderating today's panel. With that, again, thank you, Ayana, for being here today. I turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek, for that warm welcome. Um, it is indeed a pleasure to be here today moderating for you all. We are excited for the presentation. We'll be discussing, um, of course, as you said, FAFSA, as well um, as the governor's years of service. It's a new day in Maryland for our higher education, and there are several opportunities we want to let folks know about for our students as they continue to move towards degree attainment, um, as well as becoming productive citizens, whether it's entrepreneurship or going into the workforce, we wanna make sure that we're supporting our students. Uh, so we wanna go ahead and um, move over to Mr. Al Dorsett. He is the director of the Office of Student Financial Assistance, and he is our in-house subject matter expert on all things FAFSA related and financial aid related. Um, and after Al, you will hear from Miss um, Brittany Stevens. But Al, I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you, Miss Jones. And I will. Um, well, I wanted to share my screen, but my sharing has been disabled. Um, if I can't share, if uh, someone could share my presentation. And while we're waiting um, for my presentation to be shared, let me say that MHEC aims to process awards as quickly as possible for students who have completed the FAFSA in a timely uh, manner. Um, in an effort to provide a clear financial aid award picture for families and students to make their decisions. Okay, and everybody should be able to see my screen now. So, as many know, um, there's been some um, obstacles when it comes to um, the FAFSA and financial aid for the upcoming 24-25 academic year. Uh, the federal government uh, moved forward with their FAFSA simplification uh, in which they changed the whole FAFSA around in the whole process. Uh, this led to the FAFSA changing from becoming available October 1st, how it usually was, to not being available until the end of December. And then even more so with changes, um, it led to um, schools and state institutions, such as MHEC, not being able to uh, receive what we call ICERs, Institutional Student Information Records, or similar to Student SAR, Student Aid Records, that hold that FAFSA data for us to process. Uh, many complications have come up that the federal government has, has been strong in trying to attack and move forward um, so that students can receive um, their award packages from schools and states can determine what students are eligible for the different state awards that we have. Uh, last month, Department of Education delivered uh, several ICERs, thousands of ICERs, um, to uh, state entities and institutions. Uh, unfortunately, there were issues when they were delivering those ICERs, which has kind of pushed back that time frame. Now, due to that pushback and that time frame and these issues, let me indicate that uh, based off that, Maryland Higher Education did push back the um, final deadline to submit the FAFSA to June 1st, 2024, as well as we pushed back the priority deadline um, to May 15th, 2024. And those key dates are really there, right? Because we're not looking at the March 1st date anymore. We understand the obstacles that have come in. And it's not May 15th yet. So individuals that have not done their FAFSA still can do their FAFSA. 
especially now that the federal government is pushing out those records to institutions and the state. But with those issues that occurred, about 20% of applications were affected in which uh, some data fields uh, pulled from the IRS were mixed up uh, that had incorrect information on the ICERs, giving the student the wrong student aid index. Uh, in some cases, education tax credit, um, credit data field was inaccurate. In other instances, when individuals were uh, could not import their IRS information, and the federal government gave them instructions on how to manually input their tax information. Those instructions uh, were wrong in some instances where certain data was uh, told to be put in certain places when it should have been other data to be put in certain places. To help rectify this issue, um, the federal government did identify records of unaffected uh, students and records of affected students. So they provided this to uh, us as Maryland Higher Education Commission, as well as institutions for students that put listed the, their institution on their FAFSA. And this really helps because one, there's two pieces of it. As we import ICERs, and due to these issues, we have not imported these records into the MDCAP system. So individuals may have completed the FAFSA and say, well, I, you know, Maryland doesn't have my FAFSA. That's because of these different issues. We want to make sure we're not just importing bad data into the system and then trying to do awards for students and students not being appropriately awarded or even being identified as not eligible when they will be eligible. We've worked with the Department of Education through many of these errors, so we look to be importing uh, these ICER records um, as of Monday, they will be imported into the MDCAP system and students will be able to see their ICER records. Now, remember, there's two groups of students uh, because the Department of Education did identify individuals with errors, and I'll go over kind of the number of how many individuals have those errors. But what we will be doing is communicating one communication to individuals that have completed their FAFSA and have no errors, saying that we've received their FAFSA and they will get a notification. For individuals that have an error, they will get a separate notification indicating that we received their FAFSA, but the Department of Education has identified the error with their FAFSA. And that once we receive the updated FAFSA from the Department of Education, then we will move forward in reviewing them for the eligibility of their awards. So to give you an idea of how this impacts Maryland overall, Thus far, we have received 136,465 institutional student information records, which we'll just call FAFSA data moving forward. Of that FAFSA data, there were 22,530 records with errors. These are errors that the Department of Education needs to reprocess those records and reprovide them to us. Additionally, there were 15,617 rejected records. Now, reject can be anywhere from a uh, parent did not sign the FAFSA um, to uh, information was manually put incorrect. Students should have received a SAR, a student aid report, that identifies if their FAFSA was rejected. The Department of Ed has recently opened where students can now go back and start um, correcting their FAFSA uh, with their information that needs to be corrected. So students and families should be taking advantage of that. Now that it's open if the student received the, R, the SAR. The SAR, the student aid report, is very important. A lot of times students don't see it. Students don't look for it. We want to educate students and parents in making sure that they are reading that SAR, receiving that SAR, and reading that SAR so that they can kind of see where they're at uh, with their status when it comes to the family. There were a total ICERs, no errors or rejects, 98,318. So that is very good because we've got 98,000 records with no errors that we can start working on process. And then I bring this into place because this is real key. When we talk about no family ties, and I'll go more detail into it, but just looking at how many records that we received in which the applicants did not have a family size included on their FAFSA. Now, no family size is very important because although we do use, as Maryland Higher Education Commission, the SEI Student Aid Index to uh, determine 
the award amount the student should receive, right? So if a student uh, is determined eligible for the guaranteed access grant, what we do is we look at the institution that the student is attending, uh, what the cost of attendance um, is at that institution. Then we look at the student's SAI, that's subtracted uh, from the cost of attendance to determine need. And then we look at how much Pell award the student is receiving based off that SAI which determines the remaining need from that, for that student. But additionally, for us to determine a student's eligibility for the Guaranteed Access Grant, one of the requirements is that the student must be 100, within 130% of the uh, federal poverty guideline based off household size. So that family size, which is the same as household size, if it's not there, if it's no, if that value is not there, we cannot determine if that student is eligible for it. So those are one of our current challenges when we talk about family size, household size, which is really the same thing. Um, on the FAFSA, there are several different places in which um, we can um, determine family size and household size, and the federal government has given instructions recently on how to calculate that uh, which is part of that process that we've been testing, which is why the FAFSA information, as well as the MHEC-1 app information, has not been available for students to see in their MD caps yet. Uh, but this week, we are finalizing that testing. We will be importing those MHEC-1 app records, as well as those FAFSA records, into the MD cap system. And as of April 22, um, 2024, Students will be able to log in MD caps and see their FAFSA or MHEC one app information. So there are instances in which a the family size will never be on the FAFSA, uh, what we call the no value. Uh, for independent students whose parents are not required to file a federal tax return, or an independent student and spouse if ap applicable who is not required a federal tax return for the prior tax year is assigned to SAI equal to negative 1500, which we call Pell Formula 1. That individual, because they indicate that they did not, or the family indicates that they were not required to file taxes, the federal government does not do anything further on the FAST. It just says, okay, you have this Pell Formula and move forward. So it doesn't give them the opportunity to actually put what their family size is. So you may have an independent student that um, is in foster care. And that individual is independent, has no family, uh, and did not work. Uh, however, um, in that instance, the family size would not be there. Because it is an independent student, we do identify that that's one independent student, so we would not request the family size for that. But you may have a student whose parents just, you know, unfortunately do not work. It may be two in the household, or it may be three in the household. Uh, but they indicated they did not work um, or they indicated they did not file taxes because they were not required to, because the IRS does have thresholds in which individuals are not required to file taxes. In those cases, we would not know the household size because they indicated they did not file taxes on the FAFSA. Uh, the FAFSA did not ask them any more information on family size. So when we get the FAFSA, that is a null value. In these instances, we are working now on a solution in which the um, student will get notification uh, and we will request them to fill out just indicating what their foul health, um, family size is. Additionally, we will also uh, provide institutions that um, the student may have listed on their FAFSA, a roster of students who have uh, identified or are missing that family size value. So those institutions, if they have already um, contacted the student or have contact with the student and know that family size, they'll be able to update for the student. So two ways that the student will be able to update, even the institution on their behalf or that student themselves will be able to go into the NDCAP system in order to do it. And as we identify these students, we will communicate through MDCAPs and email uh, of these students and notify them what they need to do in their next steps. So we are looking on a solution or working on a solution for that. Just to reiterate, um, the GA, Guaranteed Access Grant, is determined, or one of the requirements is based off 130% of the federal poverty guidelines, based off household size. 
Uh, it is on our website, but here it is as well. Uh, so it's a family of two. Of course, um, they cannot make over $23,803. A family of three, $29,939, and so forth. So the MHEC One app, because I mentioned that a lot. Um, the MHEC One app is one application. It's not an app. It's, it's an application within the MDCAP system. And it actually replaces not only the MISFA uh, for undocumented students, but also replaces the multiple applications that we had for several of our other scholarship programs. So just like we have the Guaranteed Access Grant and we have the Educational Assistance Grant, we have a Cybersecurity Scholarship, we have a Teaching Fellow Scholarship. We have so many different scholarships that students can see. And I always tell students and individuals to point students and families to mhec.maryland.gov. Um, click on Need Money for College, and they will be able to see a list of all the different scholarships and grants that we have. But that MHEC One app uh, allows, one, undocumented students that are not eligible for federal aid, but may be eligible for state aid, to complete their application to apply for state aid. Uh, in addition, uh, it allows for students who did complete the FAFSA um, to apply for other programs. Now, students who complete the FAFSA are automatically reviewed to determine eligibility for the Guaranteed Access Grant or the Educational Assistance Grant, as well as the Promise Scholarship Program if the student indicates that they are going to the community college. However, if the student um, is looking at other scholarships that may, they may be eligible for, that student that completed the FAFSA can go on the MHEC One app and apply for scholarships through the MHEC One app using it. For undocumented students that, are, again, are not eligible to complete the FAFSA, they can use the MHEC One app not only to apply for the Guaranteed Access Grant, Educational Assistance, or Promise, but they can also use it to apply for those other programs. Students that are eligible to complete the FAFSA may not replace the FAFSA with the MHEC One. So a student who's eligible to complete the FAFSA must complete the FAFSA in order to be determined eligible at least for the Guaranteed Access Grant or Educational Assistance Grant or the Promise Program. So before we go into our awarding timeline, let's talk about the FAFSA Completion Initiative, which is a resource for many school districts, high schools, local education agencies, inserted designated uh, entities such as nonprofit organizations working with high school students. The FAFSA Completion Initiative is a process through um, our MDCAP system, our Maryland College Aid Processing System, MDCAP, in which um, those entities can um, upload a list of graduating seniors and see if those students completed the FAFSA, as well as see if uh, they are eligible for the GA, EA, or Promise Scholarship. So definitely we tell individuals that are part of these agencies to take advantage of this if you have not already. Uh, it will be available uh, this upcoming Monday, April 22nd, once the FAFSA data and MHEC one app data is loaded into our production environment. So it's not available yet because of the issues that we face with the federal government and trying to make sure everything's correct. But once we load that data in there, uh, which will be over this weekend and, and by Monday, uh, that data will be available for individuals to pull a report. So what's MHEC's plan? MHEC will begin awarding students that have completed the FAFSA and have an official student aid index starting May 1st. On May 1st, we'll be awarding, or by May 1st, we'll be awarding students that have completed the FAFSA or MHEC One app by April 15th. If a student has been selected for verification and has submitted the documentation, uh, for that, um, then they would be awarded as well. If the student has been selected for verification, which I'll get into, and did not get a chance to submit the document, that is okay. The student is not going to get passed, so the student is still going to be awarded. The student would just be awarded in our next timeline, which will be May 15th. And then we are guaranteeing that any student that has completed the FAFSA and is eligible for the Guaranteed Access Grant 
will be, as long as they complete the FAFSA by May 15th, they will be awarded. They may get their award um, May 17th, May 20th, but we are guaranteed that any student that has completed their FAFSA by May 15th submits all their documentation. So even if a student completed their FAFSA on May 14th, got notification that they have were selected for verification, did not submit their documentation until June 15th, which is the deadline for them to submit their uh, documentation for priority award. We will make sure that we still award that student because they completed their FAFSA by May 15th or prior, and they submitted their required documentation by June 15th or prior. So MHEC is dedicated to making sure that students are awarded these funds. So I talked about verification a little bit. Uh, because of the different issues with, that the, we've experienced with the federal government, uh, MHEC is reducing its verification down to a very small percentage, three to five percent. Uh, there will be two categories of selection, uh, which will be called automated and randomized. So automated. Automated is applicants that indicate they have a GED. Applicants that indicate they have a GED, the system will automatically have a requirement for them to provide us with a copy of their GED just to confirm um, receipt. If an applicant has identified as independent for other reasons than working on a master's or professional degree or 24 years of age or older, for instance, the individual indicates that they were in foster care. Um, then the system will automatically do a tracking and requirement for that individual just to provide a foster care letter in case that they request. If the individual says that they're homeless um, and they have a letter from the homeless liaison of their high school, they would just upload that letter uh, for us to confirm that information. So that's automatic. If the individual has listed any of those on there, any of the dependency questions listed on the FAFSA that makes them independent, that individual needs to provide supporting documentation. Then there's randomized. Randomized is broken into two subgroups. The first group is individuals who have a IRS response code of 203, 206, or 212, or 214. What that means is that for 203, 206, and 212, the individual tried to... Um, do the IRS information in there. There was some type of issue with it, so the IRS could not import the information. The individual did a manual um, tax entry in there, and we're looking for um, a, a copy of the taxes. That's what the system will ask for. The system will ask for a dependent or independent, depending on which one the student's classified as verification worksheet, and then a copy of the tax information. For item 214, again, a dependent or independent verification worksheet, depending on the student. And then we will ask for a non-filing form because 214 indicates that the individual did not file tax. The second subgroup is 3 to 5% of individuals who complete the MHEC 1. So these are the um, undocumented students that weren't eligible to complete a FAFSA completed the MHEC-1 app. They've been identified as potentially eligible for GA or EA, three to 5% of those individuals, and the same type of documentation as uh, the first subgroup, either dependent or independent verification worksheet, depending on uh, how the student is classified. And then if the individual says that they filed taxes, they would ask for a copy of the taxes. If the individual said that they did not file taxes, then it would be a not filed So just we talk about again access to the uh, or access requirements for eligibility. Although I push students to get that FAFSA done by May 15th, um, it is not unlike the Pell Grant a um, a abundance of funding uh, where every student is guaranteed to be. Um, state has it where there is a uh, allocation. Uh, the allocation for this year is a little bit over a hundred million dollars. Um, so we do push that every student, as much as possible, complete the FAFSA by May 15th. Because again, we are guaranteeing that individuals who complete the FAFSA by May 15th and submit all their documents, 
and their determined eligible for GA will be awarded. However, there is no guarantee um, after the May 15th. After May 15th, we will have to look at what funding is available, and we award all GA students first, um, all initial GA students first, uh, based off law. Additionally, there's been recent changes, which uh, many are excited about. Uh, the high school cumulative GPA requirement has been removed, uh, so students are no longer to, uh, required to have a certain high school GPA. The GED score was changed from 165 to 145, which is the minimum score to obtain your GED. Applicants must apply within six years of high school graduation. So before it was one year, now applicants have up to six years. And applicants must be under the age of 26. Uh, so before applicants had to be under the age of 22, now they must be the, under the age of 26. So even if an applicant is 25 years old and six months left to their birthday, as long as they get that fast foot in by the priority filing date, and they're under the age of 26, that applicant can be eligible to receive the GA grant as long as they're eligible, they meet all other eligibility requirements. The award amount for this year is expected to be 22,100. That is the maximum award amount. Of course, like I said, it is based off need. So depending on what institution a student goes to, if a student goes to one institution that has a cost of attendance of 10,000, they have a zero SAI, they're getting the max Pell, that student would not get the whole 22,000, they would get the amount up to the need to pay the remaining balance or cost of their institution. However, that student uh, attends a institution that is living on campus and their, let's say their cost of attendance is 30,000, they have a, a zero SAI, their Pell is 7,000 or $8,000, that student still has a remaining need because you take that 7,000 minus that 30,000, at least 23,000, that student will receive the maximum 22,100. So that's what we mean by remaining need. Awarding priorities. As I indicated, the first priority is always GA renewals. The second priority is EA renewals. And then GA initials. And then last, EA initials. Initials is not expected to be awarded if um, if we can until the end of June. Uh, we must and are required to award all GA students or GA eligible students first. So again, we want to make sure that we get that S for M by May 15th for that MHEC 1 app in by May 15th. For the MHEC 1 app, students want to create their MDCAPS account if they have not done so, and then complete that MHEC 1 app. And again, our aim is to award students as fast as possible so their families and them can make the best choice for it. And with that, that ends my presentation. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Al. I do see um, one question in the chat. Thank you again, though. That was a lot of great information. There was a lot of information at one time, but a lot of great information there. We heard about the null family size, the processing timeline, but we do have a question in the chat about the uh, guaranteed access grant. Susan wants to know, would a current student who did not meet the GPA requirement, would they be considered for GA? Yes. So as long as the student never received um, one of the Howard P. Rawlings um, Educational Excellence Awards, the GA or the E, um, even if they did not meet the requirement last year or they graduated two years ago, they didn't meet the requirement that first year and they're going into their third year. If that student meets the eligibility requirements, as long as they've never received it before, uh, that student will qualify. Okay. And her follow-up for that is, um, if that student is currently receiving EA, does that preclude them from obtaining um, the Maryland Guaranteed Access Grant? Yes. So once the student is identified for the award, the awards, because that both of those awards fall under the same program, those awards do not switch. So if a student is identified 
is eligible for the EA and that student receives the EA, that student doesn't switch over to the GA at another point in time. They're, they have the EA. Okay, so it's 11.32, and uh, we're going to come back to some of those other questions at the end of our program. But for now, we do want to um, introduce Ms. Brittany Stevens. He is from the Department of uh, Service and Civic Innovation. So, Brittany, just hearing what Mr. Dorsett just said about that change, being able to receive that gag up to age 26, this is um, a game changer for many of our students who um, would not previously be eligible. Um, we've told students that were Pell eligible in the past Maybe you may not want to consider that gap year, but now it looks like that gap year may end up being a good fit um, for some Pell eligible students. So I'm going to let you talk about what your program has to offer. Thank you, Ayana, and good afternoon. It is a true winning Wednesday, and yes, we have a program for you all. So I want to introduce to some and reintroduce and we're inform of others of the Department of Service and Civic Innovation. We are the newest state agency, so we're the babies on the block. We just came into fruition in April under the SERVE Act, and the SERVE Act stands for Serving Every Region Through Vocation Exploration. This program is for the entire state of Maryland, and the program that I'm talking about is the Maryland Corps service year option. So if you have a student that wants to take a gap year, we like to call it a growth year. This is a great opportunity for them and a perfect segue from what Mr. Dorsett had just said. Um, if the person is not completely ready to go to college, there is a chance for them as well because you may be scratching your head. Graduation is coming up next month. You're like, what is this student going to do? What are my previous students that may have not gone to college? Is there something that they can do? And the answer is, Yes, because it's a winning Wednesday. So there's a program for you. And there's the Department of Service and Civic Innovation. We house many things, but the greatest things is the Merlin Corps Service Year Option. If you don't remember anything from my presentation, I want you to remember serve.maryland.gov. That is serve.maryland, and Merlin is spelled out, dot gov. That is where you can find additional information as well as our member application. So let's get right on into it. So the Merlin Corps service year option, it is two streams in one river and it's raining outside right now. So I'm sad about that, but it is two streams into one river. The Merlin Corps, that is anyone that is over the age of 18, no matter what your educational background is or what your status is in life as far as if you're documented or undocumented. So you can have either dropped out of other high school or you can have your PhD. That would be the Merlin Corps. For the students that you directly work with, and that's going to be the service year option. Service year option. And it is exactly what the word means. It means that members will be serving for a year, which is, a, is essentially nine months. And it's an additional option for them to do outside of either going into college, going into a trade school, or going into the military service. And we define service in our department very broadly. So service looks like to us any and everything that is helping someone out, right? So typically you may think it's actually hands-on. You all are service workers because you're doing service for the community. Um, so it's the service year option, anyone that's the ages between 18 and 19, 21 years old that have recently earned their Merlin High School Diploma or their GED. So it is a nine month program where we match as best as our ability, our members, and those are the participants in our program, to a something that they're passionate about, something that makes their heart beat a little bit more, a career, if you will, right? We match them to either a nonprofit, for-profit, or government agency that is in their area. So it has to be locally or surrounded to them, right? So first thing is the matching, because they went on serve, Merlin.gov. They filled out the application. That's going to take them about 20 minutes to fill out. Our second deadline is on May 15th. We're going to match you as best as our ability to a host site partner. Our host site partners are either a nonprofit, for profit, or government agency that is within their community. So if you live in Caroline County, we're not going to match you to a place that's in Garrett County because that's not going to be sustainable to you. But this is for the entire state of Merlin. 
The great part of this, about this program, which really truly makes this a growth year, is our wraparound services. We have professional development, right? Our professional development goes over, but not limited to advocacy. We teach wellness, uh, how to truly interact with people, how to have tough conversations, financial literacy and education. Because we pay members minimally $15 an hour to be in this program. Now, the program is a 40-hour full work week, which looks about a nine to five. Our 40-hour work week looks slightly different than most. We know you all probably work 60 hours a week. But for this 40 hours a week, we do 30 hours of work and 10 hours of professional development. And our professional development is truly engaging. Some of them is virtually, but some of them is in person. We take our members to different community colleges, to different universities across the state of Maryland to further enhance that exposure that, you know what, college is still for me. I'm just taking nine months to do this program, right? To get hands-on experience. Outside of the professional development, our other wraparound services include, we help with transportation, we help with clothing, housing, food. So anything that may present someone as a barrier, this is a program that they can do as well. We also accept those and have accommodations with if you're a member that has an intellectual or physical difference, right? That as well. We also accept undocumented persons as well into this program. So we're really covering the whole thing. And at the end of the nine months, each member earns $6,000. That's amazing to me right there. $6,000 <laughs> at the end of the program. You guys should be excited about that. So with that $6,000, we do give it in two different ways. The first way is, one, if someone is taking this as a growth year, we want to make sure if they want to go to college, we put it into a Merlin 529 plan so they won't splurge it on shoes, clothes, and Chick-fil-A. However, outside of that, if a person does not want to go to college in their near and dear future, it's okay. We do give the $6,000 cash stipend to each member. So once again, this is a program for if you're looking for a student that does not have a plan just as if yet, that is going to take a gap year, the service year option is for them. They're going to apply at serve.merlin.gov. They're going to be matched as best as their ability, as best as our ability to a nonprofit, for-profit, or government agency that they're passionate about. These are meaningful work experiences. We're not just placing people um, in a program. And also, we have them interview with the host site partner as well. So it's a mutual agreement, right? It's really great. Wraparound services, $15 an hour, nine months. Only have to do this program for nine months. But you can stay on for an additional year because we know most of our members may not be quite ready after that nine months. All of our jobs, we've asked our host site partner to make sure, do you have the capacity to hire our members on at a full-time place, right? So once again, 18 to 21, service year option, Merlin Core, anyone in the, over the age of 18 years old, two different streams, one river, a load, a load, a load of wraparound services, professional development, money, of course, and also a great experience. This is the first state back program in the nation. So you should be very proud that our governor has brought this forth to us. And this is truly the best department in the state. And I, cause I'm saying that cause there's a lot of state departments on here right now. The department of service and civic innovation, please do apply today. Um, by going to serve.maryland.gov. If you have any other questions, um, please, please, at this time, I'll yield. Now, also put our email in the chat. If your question does not get answered or has not been already answered, please feel free to reach out. If you are in the school system right now, we would love to come to do a presentation with your students. Trust in me, I am here, there, and everywhere. I love to drive. So if you invite me out, please do. So if you have, if you're in, Mountain Merlin, or if you are in Eastern Shore, we will be there as well. So I also see if to hear if, if I left anything now. To hear is my amazing co colleague that is over all of the professional development, and it is amazing. It's not a bore at all. You see the energy that I have. That's the energy that our professional development gives as well. So um, if I did, I leave anything out and 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 open it for questions.
I think you did amazing. I'm, I'm Tahira Holmes, education and workforce lead, and I'm just serving as Brittany's Robin to, you know, you see her amazing Batman today. So you covered it all, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you both. I uh, really, really appreciate that. Thank you for the energy. As we know, in order for gap years to be successful, they, um, one, have to be intentional and two, be focused on your point, growth. So it sounds like uh, your program, the Governor's uh, Year of Service, fits the bill for that. Um, we're going to go in and see if we do have any questions in the chat. We know that this round uh, is for educators. So if you have any questions in the chat, please let us know. Um, I do say, Carrie, how are students going to be aware of this opportunity? Brittany, you've already expressed you are all over the state of Maryland doing those in-person presentations. You want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so we're we're going to do um in in person presentations just right here right now, and also you care you can be an advocate amplify these new services to persons as well. It's always we grow stronger together. So also advocate for this program, talk about it to this program. If you have a particular school or or an event that you would like us to come out to, please let us know. We will be there. When I say the mouths are mouthing, we are all over the state of Maryland, making sure that persons are understanding that this is a this is an additional option. And also, I do want to let folks know that just because someone applies to this particular program does not mean that they have to commit themselves to the program, because right now they're still waiting on their FAFSA. Give those students another option. You don't want someone in, in June and July, I don't have a plan. College fell through. My FAFSA fell through. Um, my parents don't have the resources for me to go to this school. Have them have additional options. So this is another option for them. So, And I'm also going to put our... Um, our email into the chat as well. Please reach out if you have any type of opportunities for us to come out and speak. Our um, applications for host site partners are going to be due on May 1st. We have an extended deadline for our member applications for May 15th. Apply, 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 serve.merlin.gov. All right. Thank you, Tahira. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, we will take questions in the chat. Now you all are educators, so I know that you all like it when the students raise their hand and ask good questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. And thank oh, you. Yeah, for we did Charles County. I did. Uh, Char I, we did a a big fair in Charles County. I think it's only seven schools in Charles County. Went to four of them, and then the the big fair all had all seven schools at that at Charles County. But we will, we would love to love to come. I will have to check my date. If you can email that um, address right there to see if we are available at May on May 8th. But we have definitely been there. Oh, that was a direct message. So I'm saying this out loud. Sorry. It's okay. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> we got the context clues. We're educators. We're good. Yes. <laughs> that's perfect. That's that's really, really good. Yeah. And to your point, we're all going to be ambassadors, right? This for this governor's uh, year of service. So we're going to give the students all the options, lay it out on the table, so they leave no stone unturned. And I heard that six thousand dollars. So we are also not leaving any money on the table either. So that's great for us to know. Any further questions before we move on? Um, this could be also a question uh, for Mr. Dorsett from MHEC. Please. Go ahead and put those in the chat, or if you want to come off mute, you can do that as well. Just let us know, but preferably leave those questions in the chat. I appreciate you, um, Derek, for putting this together. We have to get this information out to the stakeholders who will um, also get this out to the students as well. Yes, yes. You're most welcome, Ayana. Most welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. So as it looks like there are no uh, further questions, uh, thank you all, uh, the educators, for joining us for this 11 o'clock session. Um, oh, we do have a question from Brian. And Brian is asking, I think this is for you, Al, for those that are selected for MHEC verification, will the schools receive notice of those students? 
So for the student selected for verification, uh, the high schools will be able to pull their uh, FAFSA completion, uh, and they will see that, um, as well as the colleges will see um, on their roster when a student has been selected for verification. Yeah, and I do want to um, just reiterate something you said earlier, Al. We need to make sure families are going back and looking at um, those FAFSA submission summaries, formerly known as the SARS, but definitely going back and looking at those FAFSA submission summaries, looking for anything that needs to be corrected. Um, did you mm -hmm. want to say a little bit more about that? Sure. So uh, definitely students have the ability to go on back on their studentaid.gov. Uh, there is a history records mailbox that students can go to. I've completed the FAFSA uh, for one of my children, so I was able to go in there and see my records. So there's a history of it. It tells you what's been completed. Uh, I did not check to see if the SAR was in there because we got the email. Uh, but, you know, really, again, uh, have the students go back into studentaid.gov. Really, you know, not only look at what they've done and have that information, but it's it's big on reading and being prepared. The more you read, the more you're prepared. Take a few minutes out, you know, on a Saturday morning or, you know, a Friday evening. You know, we, we tell parents to read with their um, students. You know, definitely educators push for students and families um, to work together uh, because it is a joint effort uh, right there. And I did see um, a question that I had uh, replied to, but um, some students are indicating that they're a uh, three-fourth college student, meaning they may not be going full-time. The Guaranteed Access Grant uh, and the Educational Assistance Grant does require a student to be full-time. However, uh, the Promise Scholarship, new requirements on that allow a student to be at least half-time. Uh, so students attending community college, they can go half-time, they can go three-fourths time, uh, they can still receive the promise. And the promise is another big scholarship that's really big. The promise is five thousand up to five thousand a year. It's a last dollar award. It covers, you know, the remaining need right there. When you look at the community college, community college, you know, twelve credits full time is about three thousand dollars a semester these days. So when you're looking at going uh, less than full time or half time, um it's it's less of a cost, and there's money out there for individuals. As long as the um, student's family makes under a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, they are qualified for the Promise Scholarship. So uh, definitely, uh, individuals look at that. And then there's other scholarships. Again, I tell individuals to go on mhec.maryland.gov. You go on there, you, you scroll down just a teeny bit. And there's need money for college. You click on that, and it's a list of all of our different scholarship programs, even the senatorial, uh, the delegate. Uh, I could keep going. We have over 30 different programs that uh, MHEC administers, and those are all different types of aid programs. So I definitely tell individuals to go on there, and I see we put that on our website. Um, so, you know, take advantage. And I have a question from um, James. He would like to know, are students who are attending an out-of-state university that is online, are they eligible for any of the MHEC scholarships? So the two scholarships that um, allow students to um, be online, um, which is depending on their program, are the senatorial and delegate. Uh, for both of those scholarships, the student writes to their senator or delegate on our webpage, um, there's a link for them to see who their senator or delegate in their district is. Um, mm -hmm. If that online program is a unique program, a program that is not offered within the state of Maryland, then that student may be approved if awarded a delegate or senator or scholarship to use that scholarship out of state, even if they're doing online. However, if the program is in Maryland, um, then no, there are no other programs. And, you know, the biggest thing we've got to understand is that, you know, every state wants their students to stay in state. Why? Because, you know, the state is going to give you money and, and support you being in state. We understand a lot of students want to go out of state. They want to get away. 
But, you know, we, we look at the aspect of getting individuals to think about what resources they have. Because it's not that, you know, you can't go out of state, but what resources do you have? So Maryland gives resources to Maryland residents that go to school in Maryland. If you're in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania gives uh, resources to Pennsylvania residents that stay in Pennsylvania and so forth like that. So that's kind of the way that it goes. But again, Maryland has some of the greatest institutions top-notch education, and, you know, I tell individuals if they save money by going to a Maryland institution, they can always go study abroad because they save money by going to a Maryland mm -hmm. institution. So instead of getting out of state, you can get out of the country. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Uh, any other questions for the chat? This is being recorded. It will be, um, I believe, Al placed on the uh, MHEC YouTube channel. Um, if someone can, Catherine, if you're there, if you can drop that in the chat. Great. Yep. Thank you so much. All right. So with that, um, we're going to thank you all for uh, your commitment to ensuring that the students get the information, the most up-to-date information, and the robust, most robust information possible. Um, we've heard about the changes to the FAFSA. We've heard about the changes to um, the Guaranteed Access Grant. And thank you again to the Governor's Year of Service. Um, again, this is a reminder, if you have any further questions, all those links are in the chat. We thank you for joining us today. Everybody have a great day. We'll be back again um, for our next session later on this afternoon. Thank you, Ayana. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. That was great.